I expect that people of my generation will always see World War II as the great modern watershed of change. Hitler was defeated, fascism was destroyed, socialism advanced into the center of Europe, the Chinese Revolution followed, the colonial empires came to an end. What greater, what greater change could there, could there be than this? We should be allowed our vanity. But by any measure, a vastly greater change occurred with World War I. When this cafe in Krakow was still relatively new and a favorite resort of intellectuals at the time, it was in World War I that political systems that had been centuries in the building came apart, sometimes in a matter of weeks. Before World War I, the traditional rulers and the capitalists had no doubts about their future. They thought they were forever. And socialists had no doubts about socialism. After World War I, nothing was ever so certain again. The age of uncertainty began. World War II, in a certain sense, was the last great battle of World War I. What came unglued in the First World War was a social order and a structure of government. Here in Poland, as elsewhere in Eastern Europe, land was still the vital source of power. The traditional landed families were politically dominant. Kings and emperors still ruled. Capitalism and capitalists were a minor force. It was a structure that shared power between the ancient rulers and the landowners on the one hand, and the new capitalists, businessmen, on the other. In the industrial countries, with the exception of Britain, farmers and peasants rivaled, usually exceeded in number, the industrial workers. Krakow and this part of Poland then belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. A few miles away, the Russian Empire began. Imperialism and colonialism are words that we have come to associate with Asia and Africa and Latin America. But here in Eastern Europe, there was a much more comprehensive, intimate kind of imperialism. It was like that of the English in Ireland, and it involved the same kind of refined hatreds. Here, the colonial people were often the equal in education and cultural development of their masters. Often they were superior, or so regarded themselves. All were white, at least when washed. Few felt they should be ruled by others. Almost everyone ruled the Poles. Krakow, as I've said, was ruled from Vienna. Warsaw was ruled from St. Petersburg. Poznan, an ancient center of Polish culture, was ruled from Berlin. The Russians ruled Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, Finns. Besides the Poles, Austrians ruled Bohemians, Slovaks, Ruthenians, Croats, Italians, and many others. It was here in Eastern Europe that the great modern retreat from imperialism began. However, in 1914, it was not the subject people that were the source of uncertainty, fear. The Tsar and the others felt secure. The fear was of rival rulers, of the ambition for the territory that had always meant wealth and power. Austria was known to want something in Serbia, and Russia in Turkey, and Germany in France. And the British seemed always to be picking up territory somewhere. Out of these fears had come the alliances. Austria allied herself with Germany, got the industrial support, military discipline she needed. Austria gave in return her polyglot manpower. Russia reached out to France for subsidies, help in building her railroads and industry. From Britain, Russia got the sea power she lacked. Maybe also a moral sanction for her despotism. Britain and France saw in Russia a vast supply of our manpower. This led to the many references, early in World War I, to the Russian steamroller. The steamroller that was to roll principally on Russia itself. I suppose there's no subject known to history that has been so much debated as the causes of World War I. Maybe great events can have simple causes. Lloyd George thought that the great powers simply stumbled into the war. The rivalry, the competition for European and overseas markets between German and British capitalism, is almost invariably cited and is believed by all scholars of decently subtle mind. Although similar competition seems not to cause so much trouble now, there is a better explanation. Since the beginning of historical experience, land and men have been the basis of princely wealth and power. The extent and quality of his land was what determined the wealth of a prince or a ruler. 
The extent and quality of the land was what determined the number, and perhaps also the quality, of the soldiers that he could muster. Thus his wealth, and thus his military power, and thus of territory, the territorial imperative. This belief in land and men was part of the deepest instinct of the old ruling houses of Eastern Europe, as one would expect. It was still a factor between France and Germany. Between the Habsburgs and the Romanovs, it was vital, perhaps I should say mortal. So each ruler eyed his neighbor with suspicion. Each believed that he wanted the territory that was thought decisive for wealth and power. Each had immensely detailed mobilization plans developed over decades, and these, as might be expected, envisaged thoughtfully that the fighting would be on someone else's land. No one, and certainly not the rulers, gave much thought to political and social consequences. There had always been wars. The ruling class had always survived, and so they would again. The trumpeter still recalls in Krakow the battle of Christian Europe against the Tatar invader. That was a wonderfully simple war game as compared with 1914. The act of mobilization, as I just said, envisaged an intention to take up a position on someone else's land. The other countries knew this intention. Their response was to mobilize as a precaution. But mobilization assumed attack. So once mobilization started, everyone was an aggressor. Everything was in danger of getting out of control. Those who could mobilize most rapidly attacked first. Those who were attacked defended, called on their allies to attack. Historians have always spoken of a chain reaction. A chain reaction has a known result. One needs a better metaphor. This was really a rogue reaction, one with a course no one could foresee, a result no one could foretell. It began with the accidentally successful outcome of the botched assassination of the Austrian Archduke. After the shots at Sarajevo, the reaction then developed its own absurd momentum. Austria sent an ultimatum to Serbia, blamed for the assassins. Russia supported her fellow Slavs in Serbia. Germany, Austria's ally, threatened Russia. Britain and France, Russia's allies, then had to warn Germany. Germany declared war on Russia. And on France, sent an ultimatum to Belgium. Britain declared war on Germany. France declared war on Austria. Britain followed her lead. Austria declared war on Belgium, which Germany had already invaded informally. Montenegro, not exactly a world power, joined the Allies against Austria. The Turks later joined the Central Powers against Russia and her allies. Japan joined the Allies and annexed Germany's possessions in China. The Japanese then, with infinite wisdom, contented themselves with watching. A very good idea to go to war without fighting. Life had been wonderful for the old ruling coalition, the landed aristocrats and the capitalists. They had power, prestige, wealth, and security in all of these. Did anyone think that these privileges would survive the conflict? As we'll see, they didn't think. Although the rulers had not given any thought to the social consequences of war, the workers had. Their leaders were not so averse to mental effort, and they had thought much about what war meant for the working classes. That was because the workers had seen themselves as the natural casualties of war, and so seeing themselves, they had thought about their salvation. They would unite across national frontiers for their common protection. So united, they would use their parliamentary power to oppose credits, money, for war. Mobilization would be stopped by strikes. If necessary, the weapon of ultimate power would be employed, the general strike. Then all movement of troops would end, all production would stop, all economic life would be suspended. The war makers would be brought to a halt by the massed power of their own workers. It didn't happen. In 1914, the German Social Democrats were the world model for the working class parties. In the hour of danger, said their leader when the day came, we will not desert our fatherland. We will get in the block for the war credits. It was the same in Vienna. But the French Socialists, it was also the same. 
The French government had a comprehensive plan for crushing protest. Arrest of strike leaders, mobilization of troublemakers. And to the sorrow of some of its authors, the plan had to be shelved. There was no need. In Britain, there was pressure from the recruiting officers, but no conscription. Instead, men flocked to enlist. The only resistance was from a handful of socialists and pacifists. The most prominent of these was Ramsay MacDonald. His was a stalwart act. Many thought it cured him of such behavior for life. In Russia, the Bolshevik members of the Duma, the Russian parliament, opposed the war. But they were few in number and were soon expelled. And in Russia, the workers didn't matter much anyway. It was the peasants who counted, and when their traditional masters spoke, they still obeyed. But <clears throat> these events were of particular interest to one notable resident of Poland. That was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, known except to his intimates as Lenin. He was living here in Krakow because that was as close to the Russian border as he was allowed to get. Following an earlier jail sentence and three years in Siberia, he had been in exile since the beginning of the century, except for a few months in 1905. But Krakow was near the Russian border, and revolutionaries went back and forth in considerable numbers, many of them to visit Lenin, whose stature as a revolutionary leader was now acknowledged. The movement was illegal, but illegality was a way of life with these gentlemen. Once a member of the Duma, one Muranov, came to see Lenin. Lenin rebuked him for making a clandestine crossing. After all, he had parliamentary immunity. No one could arrest him. Muranov explained that it had never occurred to him that you could do things like this legally. The revolutionaries seeking Lenin could very often find him here at Yama Miklika, but not in the summer of 1914. Lenin had long believed that imperial rivalry, rivalry between the great capitalist powers made war inevitable. But no more than anyone else did he think it was imminent in those summer months. So like any good bourgeois, he was up at a resort in the mountains. He was in Peronin, in the Tatra Mountains, near the Polish ski resort of Zakopane. His house, which still stands, is of gleaming wood. It's a lovely example of the local style. Lenin was 44 that summer. Like Marx and Engels, and revolutionaries in general, he was of middle-class origin. His father had been a school teacher and a school superintendent. Revolution ran in the family. Lenin's older brother had been involved in an amateurish plot to assassinate Tsar Alexander III. He had refused to express regret. The Tsar had expressed warm admiration for the boy before having him hanged. Lenin's wife, Krupskaya, has left a classic account of their life. Lenin was fond of the mountains and of music, especially Beethoven's Sonata Pathetique. She told of that summer as war came. The air was wonderful, and although there were frequent mists and drizzle, the view of the mountains during clear intervals was extremely beautiful. We walked a great deal and visited Cherny Staff, a mountain lake of extraordinary beauty, and other places in the mountains. It was Marx who gave us our mental image of a revolutionary. Beard, unruly hair, untidy dress, untidy eating. Lenin was neat, well-groomed, conservative. One thinks of a chartered account. The revolutionary fire was in the intensity of his purpose and in his speech. Once, some 15 years or so ago, I was visited in Cambridge by a Soviet historian, an old man who had served in Budeni's cavalry in the revolution, who had known Lenin. Lenin, to his great delight, had once told him that he was the only known case on record of a cavalryman with brains. I asked him if he would describe the revolutionary leaders as he remembered them, as he had seen them, and he smiled and said, well, when Trotsky spoke, we were entranced. But when Lenin spoke, we marched. Lenin was the disciple of Marx, but not his slave. On important matters, he went beyond the master. In one of his more notable observations on revolution, he said, the aim is not to achieve indiscriminate unity, but unity for the merciless revolutionary struggle of the proletariats against the ruling class. He was strongly affirmed in this belief when the working class parties of Germany and France voted for the war. Previously, those who were for socialism and the triumph of the masses were called social democrats. Subsequently, with Lenin leading the way, the truly committed would come to have a distinctive name, the communists. And, though reluctantly, Lenin departed from Marx on the role of the peasantry 
in the revolution. This was an intensely practical matter. Lenin was a Russian. Russia was an agricultural country. In 1890, when Lenin was coming first to the ideas of Marx, there were only about two and a half million industrial workers in all of the Russian Empire. To wait for capitalism and then for the seizure of power by the resulting proletariat would be to wait forever. In Russia, some peasants had land, but most wanted more. They believed that the land of the landlords belonged by ancient right to them. Marx would first have had capitalism rescue these peasants from the idiocy of rural life, his phrase. Lenin thought it far more practical to promise them the land, and this he did. All this was still in the future. The August guns brought more practical problems for Lenin in the form of the police. Previously, he'd been a pleasant thorn on the side of the Tsar. Now, conceivably, he was a Russian patriot, maybe a spy. He was arrested, and the arresting officers came here, and along with Lenin, they seized notebooks containing several columns of figures. Perhaps the figures were codes, although, in fact, they were agricultural statistics. An accompanying official made fun of the whole proceedings. He suggested to the police that maybe a jar of paste that they found here in Lenin's rooms was a, was a bomb. Austria-Hungary, it had long been said, was a despotism tempered by carelessness, or maybe casualness. There was some indication in these proceedings of the truth of that saying. After a relatively short stay in jail, Lenin and his family were allowed to go to Switzerland, a country where from earlier years of exile, they could feel reasonably at home. Meanwhile, peasants and men of all the diverse and dissident races were given arms, mobilized into the imperial armies. One thinks of this now as an act of supreme stupidity. Where might those guns be turned if things got out of hand? Stupidity is not a negligible force in human affairs, a proposition in which all with any experience in military matters will agree. And it was an especially powerful force in World War I. Military position, like political power, was hereditary. Generals were selected for reasons of family, age, military style, or horsemanship, and not for intelligence. As happens more often than we imagine, the intelligent man was known to ask questions, make a nuisance of himself, though brains were a positive disqualification. Meanwhile, developments from before World War I had posed for the generals a problem far beyond their metal reach. By 1914, military technology had advanced greatly in small arms ordnance. This was cheap and easy engineering, and its most notable product was the machine gun. One such gun well in place was the equal of a hundred or more men advancing with rifles. To the machine gun, the old generals of the old system had only one basic answer. Send ever increasing numbers of men against the guns after an ever heavier artillery bombardment. The machine guns, enough of them, invariably survived the bombardment. And the men who then advanced did not. The political leaders in their turn would think of nothing better than to trust the generals. Out of this combination of simple circumstances and simple minds came the great test of the system. The real revolutionaries were the generals in France and on the Eastern Front. By contrast, the admitted revolutionary, now in Switzerland, was leading a very sedentary scholarly life. Lenin in Bern was reading, writing, lecturing, and waiting. Money was scarce, although some came to him from his family and friends in Russia. Such things were not so well controlled in that war as they were later. He was not without companions. Switzerland in the 20 years before the Russian Revolution was, again by modern standards, an unbelievably liberal and tolerant place. It's possible that it harbored more Russian revolutionaries than Russia itself. Certainly those in Switzerland were more influential, and because they stayed up all night arguing, landladies charged them extra. Krupskaya told of Lenin's work. Ilyich ardently devoted himself to the mobilization of the forces for the struggle on the international front. It does not matter that we now number only a few individuals, he once remarked. 
millions were given us. We lived in Bern on the Stilbeck, a small, tidy, quiet street adjoining the Bern forest. Sometimes we would sit and talk for hours while Ilyich jotted down outlines of his speeches and articles and polished his formulations. While the generals did his work in France and Russia, Lenin even had time for more holidays. He went to the mountains, as he had before in Poland, and found to his pleasure that the Swiss librarians were glad to mail him the books he needed. One sent a postcard to the library with one's address and a request to send the book required. No questions asked, no certificates, no guarantees that one would not cheat the library out of the book. A complete contrast to bureaucratic France. This arrangement enabled Ilyich to work in this out-of-the-way place. Ilyich had nothing but praise for Swiss culture. Lenin could not content himself with a passive, bookish life, even though the generals and the old ruling classes might be doing his work for him on the fronts. Some kind of direct revolutionary action was called for. The weapons of the revolutionaries were two, the pamphlet or tract and the conference. The most famous of the wartime conferences was held here at Zimmerwald, now just a few minutes from Bern, and the conferees took their meals in this cafe, which was then very much as it is now. Every new development required a conference. Nothing could be accomplished without a conference. And after a conference, anything was possible. Not even the, not even the modern sales executive is more committed to the conference as a way of life than were Lenin and his colleagues. The actual meetings of the conferees of the revolutionaries were held not here in this cafe, but up the hill, a few hundred yards from here. The 38 delegates who came from 11 countries were conducted out from Bern on horseback. As conspirators, they were in good form. They were not told of their destination, though they repeatedly inquired. And the local citizens heard they were ornithologists, bird watchers. And according to legend, they encouraged this suspicion. The birds, as they look back at these bird watchers, Lenin, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Radek, were amazed. After two hours, saddle sore, they came in sight of the village. The conference was due to start at four o'clock that afternoon. I've often thought we should understand conferences better than we do. They're only rarely to exchange information, reach decisions. Much more often they're to proclaim shared goals, to show the participants that they're not alone, and therefore to improve the morale of the conferees. And most often of all, they are to simulate action under circumstances where no action is possible. Uh, to show the participants, and maybe other people as well, that something is happening when in fact nothing is happening. The meeting of the militant Social Democrats here in Simmerfeld in September 1915 had quite a few of these latter purposes. The question was how workers should react to the war, obviously. Lenin's position was very much as before. Workers of different countries were not enemies. All had enemies in common, the Tsar, the other rulers, and the capitalists. Let them therefore turn their guns on these enemies and not on each other. He argued his case, I think we can be sure, with energy and force, but without success. Only a handful supported him. National feeling was still strong. There was some simple pacifism. And most of all, the delegates had to be cautious. Ornithologists or not, they had to go home. So, as in 1914, Lenin was still isolated, still marching by himself. He went back to Bern in a state of deep depression, back to work in the library. In the autumn of 1915, we sat in the libraries more diligently than ever, but all this could not remove the feeling of being cooped up in this democratic cage. Somewhere beyond, a revolutionary struggle was mounting. Life was astir, but it was also far away. The question of imperialism, its economic essence, the exploitation of the colonies arose in all their magnitude. 
It is on these questions that Illich worked at the end of 1915 and in 1916, gathering materials for his pamphlet, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Lenin's theory of imperialism was perhaps his most compelling contribution to revolutionary thought. It's not an impressive document. Much of it is from J.A. Hobson, the English social reformer, as Lenin concedes. The theory held that half a century earlier, European capitalism had reached its peak, as our economic landscape shows. Then, instead of collapsing, as Marx had foretold, capitalism had grown stronger. It had been saved from the scheduled collapse by investment, development, exploitation in the colonial world. British, French, and German workers reaped some of the benefit. They were, in effect, standing on the backs of the colonial peoples. Colonies meant survival for capitalism, and so out of the struggle for capitalist survival had come the present war. There was an even more breathtaking consequence. Socialism had previously been thought principally relevant to the workers in the advanced countries of the West. They had reached the stage of social development where they might reasonably be expected to take over. With Lenin, revolution became a matter of the utmost importance to the rest of the world. Only the revolution would get the Western capitalists and the Western workers off the backs of the peasant masses of Africa, China, India, Indonesia, or wherever. Lenin took the revolution to Russia, and in a very real sense, he sent it on to China. Outside of neutral Switzerland, the slaughter went on and on. In June 1916, the year of the most sanguinary slaughter in the West, Lenin completed imperialism. That April, he had thought it time for another use of his second weapon, the conference. This time they met in more remote Kiantal. The socialists of the warring nations still had to be convinced that the workers must follow Lenin in turning the guns on their own ruling classes. But 12 instead of eight delegates now supported Lenin, a modest though perceptible gain. The resolution that was passed was also less cautious. Lenin and his wife seemed to have been encouraged or maybe they were whistling to keep up their spirits. Here is the key passage of the resolution. It is obvious that the revolutionary mass action during the war can only lead to the transformation of the imperialist war into civil war for socialism. The struggle for a durable peace can only take the form of a struggle for realization of socialism. that caution was in order, three German officers and 32 privates were executed the following month for distributing copies of these sentiments in the German trenches. The first clear call of king and country had now faded. No one would any longer be in doubt as to what the war was like. But the protesting minority remained still infinitely small. The great discovery of World War I was not of the weakness of the old ruling structure, of the traditional ruling classes and the new capitalist power. The discovery was of its almost incredible strength. It was still showing that it could command millions of people to their death without a murmur and more often than not with enthusiasm. liberate all of France in 1944 cost all of the Allied armies about 40,000 dead. Here on these fields in 1916, British and French deaths were an estimated 200,000. At Verdun in that same year, French and German soldiers to the number of 270,000 were killed. The most luminous act of incompetence occurred here on this pasture. On the 1st of July, 1916, the Newfoundland Regiment attacked from the trenches that you can still see and over the shell holes that you can still see, and it attacked against barbed wire 
and machine guns and artillery that through miscalculation was still very largely intact. Within 40 minutes, 40 minutes, 658 soldiers and 26 officers were either killed, wounded, or missing. That was 91% of the entire attacking force. All of the officers who attacked were casualties. The signs here say German line, Newfoundland line. The result was pretty much as though Newfoundland had taken on the whole military power of the German Empire. This was the test. And initially, at least, there wasn't any effort to disguise the nature of the war. It was for king and country, Kaiser and Reich. Roughly speaking, for the ruler and the system. Only after the United States came in did our national genius for finding high moral purpose begin to assert itself. Then the war became one to make the world safe for democracy. Further, to remind the men for whom they were fighting, the traditional rulers, or their offspring, showed up in the trenches from time to time on a quiet day. The men had an even more intimate manifestation of the system in their own officers. It was accepted in World War I that men would be led or sent to their death by officers of superior rank who held that rank because of superior birth or social position. But the testing of the system by mass slaughter had another striking result. Although it was not much perceived at the time, the better educated the soldiers, the more literate, the more culturally advanced as these things are commonly calculated, the more willingly they accepted death. The well-educated soldiers of Canada, Australia, New Zealand had a particularly high reputation as fighting men. Likewise, the more mature the capitalist society, the better its men fought. The industrial proletariat of Germany and England was especially reliable. A hard fact for Lenin. And the most illiterate and backward of the armies, the one from the country where capitalism was least advanced, was the one that revolted. That, of course, was the army of the Tsar. None of this was yet evident to Lenin, although his hope for revolution was diminishing. He prepared for a longer stay in Switzerland, and in 1916, with Krupskaya, moved from Bern to the more cosmopolitan atmosphere of Zurich. In Zurich, there was a considerable number of young foreigners imbued with revolutionary sentiments. There were a lot of workers there, the Social Democratic Party there was more inclined to the left, and there seemed to be less of the petty bourgeois spirit about the place. On January 22nd, 1917, Lenin addressed a gathering of youthful revolutionaries here in the Volkshaus in Zurich. He assessed the prospect of the eventual triumph of the proletariat, he had no doubt. But by now, he had been more than 10 years, more than a decade in exile. It was two and a half years since he had left Poland. Years of waiting, wasted years. He concluded his lecture, his wife said sadly, with these words. We of the older generation may not live to see the decisive battles of this coming revolution. He was wrong. One day after dinner, when Ilyich was getting ready to leave for the library, and I had just finished with the dishes, Bronsky ran in with the announcement. Haven't you heard the news? There is a revolution in Russia. And told us what was written in the special editions of the newspapers. We went to the lake, where on the shore all the newspapers were hung up as soon as they came out. We read the telegrams over several times. There really was a revolution in Russia. <laughs> The next day, Lenin was desperate. How could he and they get to Russia? An airplane? That was mentioned only as an idle dream. Out through France? The French would not regard him as a helpful influence in Petrograd. They would most likely arrest him forthwith. To go through Germany was to risk being regarded as a German agent when he arrived. Still, that was the only chance. The Germans, on the same evidence, arrived at the opposite conclusion. For them, it would be excellent to have Lenin in Russia, an inspired troublemaker. Eventually, a Swiss socialist, Fritz Platten, arranged the deal. Lenin and some 20 colleagues would go through Germany. It would be on an extraterritorial or non-German train, a rather difficult concept. 
Better speak simply of a sealed train, and so the famous reference. It has always been imagined that the Germans wanted to be protected from the Leninist infection. They weren't that frightened. It was Lenin who wanted to minimize his exposure to the Germans. Of course, in giving us permission to travel, the German government was under the impression that the revolution was a terrible disaster for a country and thought that by allowing emigre internationalists to pass through to their native country, they would help spread this disaster in Russia. The Bolsheviks were very little concerned with what the bourgeois German government thought. Lenin was very much concerned with what the Russian people would think of this help from the bourgeois Germans, worried about his reception. So it was a somber passage. On April 3rd, 1917, by the Russian calendar, which was then 13 days behind time, they came to the Finland station. Lenin was still some distance from power. But the Tsarist regime had shown itself not only anachronistic, but supremely incompetent. Its generals, with some notable exceptions, made even Haig and Pétain seem cerebral. So it had sunk under its own incompetence. The new government of Alexander Kerensky, if it could be called a government, was now sinking. By autumn, power was there for the taking. Again, revolution was the kicking in of the rotten door. For his seizure of power, the disciplined followers in the small Russian proletariat served Lenin well. And in the end, the resistance was not very great. There was much excitement, but little bloodshed. Lenin's real achievement was in keeping and consolidating power in proceeding from anarchy and civil war to the gaining of firm authority over all that vast country in the next five years. In these years he came to see and reflect on his greatest miscalculation. In capitalism, he had argued, and the rest would be a job for clerks, clerks if you prefer. Instead, socialist management showed itself bureaucratic, depressingly incompetent. Our apparatus is pretty bad, he conceded, adding that the first steam engine invented was bad too. In 1921, with the new economic policy, he retreated briefly toward capitalism to solve the administrative problem. It remained for Stalin, with all his force and brutality, to complete the establishment of socialism. That the old order had become unglued in Russia, no one would doubt. The old rulers, the old landed aristocrats, and the new capitalists all disappeared. But elsewhere too, the change was great and forever. In the Western European countries, the coalition between the capitalists, the businessmen, and the traditional ruling classes was gone for all time. And with it, the old certainties. The new coalition was between businessmen, large and small, and the trade unions. It was less coherent than the old coalition of capitalists and the traditional ruling classes, but it was no less real. So oh, now, the age of uncertainty. Starting from here in Turin, home of Fiat, we see the industrial problem that Lenin did not foretell. No less than capitalism, its business enterprises require intelligent, careful, and disciplined management. It was for this reason that the Soviets came here to Italy to enlist the help of Fiat in the development and improvement of their motor car industry. Fiat's are made here, and their close twins are made on the banks of the Volga. Peter Kapitsa, the great Soviet scientist, once said on a visit to Harvard that automobiles were not part of the instinct of the Russian people. That might have been a reason for coming here, but however that may be, Fiat and Soviet engineers use broadly similar equipment and assembly lines to make a closely similar car in Turin and Togliatograd. The organization and the tests of performance are the same. It is on the modern large business firm that both capitalism and communism now converge. This has a further effect on the distribution of power in all the industrial countries. The corporation employs workers, but it also has a huge technical, scientific, administrative apparatus. It sustains a penumbra of small firms which supply it, sell its products, 
and sometimes even repair them. It needs a large civil service and a big educational establishment. All of these groups want a say in government. None wants to surrender exclusive power to the industrial proletariat. This partly explains the rise of intellectual dissent in Russia. And it explains why Italian communists, breaking with Moscow, concede that they can no longer hope for a monopoly of power. Another problem for Lenin. But Lenin, as we've seen, was also a very practical politician. He would have perceived how power, since his time, has been diffused to new groups, and he would have seen the impossibility of its being seized and monopolized by any one. There might well have been another pamphlet. In any case, the dictatorship of the proletariat, like so much else, has now surrendered to the tyranny of circumstance. Too long been the vultures bred. 